Uh, ladies and gentlemen, everyone out there, uh, I am incredibly honoured and excited to welcome Professor Stephen Hinshaw um, here with us today. And I'm going to just read out, it'll probably take me about three days to read out everything um, uh, Professor Stephen's done, but I'm just going to read this out and then we'll get stuck into it. So Stephen is a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley, where he's department chair from 2004 to 2011, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at UC San Francisco. He received his AB from Harvard and after directing school programs and residential summer camps for children with special needs, his doctorate in clinic psychology was from UCLA. His research focuses on the development of psychopathology, and you know what I'm like with my education, people don't ask me to spell that, uh, clinical interventions with children and adolescents with attention deficits, hyperactivity, and mental illness stigma. Listen to this. Professor Stephen has authored over 370 articles and chapters, plus 12 books, people, 12 books. That's nearly a rugby football team of books. His memoir, Another Kind of Madness, A Journey Through a Stigma and Hope of Mental Illness, St. Martin's 2017, was awarded Best Book in Autobiography Memoir by the American Book Fest in 2018. His work has also been featured regularly in the media, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Huffington Post, Wall Street Journal, Today Show, CBS Evening News, ABC World News Tonight, CNN, and many more. Uh, because of what I've just read out, Professor Stephen cannot get his life story into one podcast. So we're going to do it in two parts because, um, and Stephen, if you don't mind me calling you Stephen, has a fascinating story, which we'll dig into more of an episode. And we're going to cover off a couple of topics, you know, um, stigma, also Stephen's backstory, which I think is incredible. Um, so you just by reading out those things Stephen you are I love calling you can I call you professor Stephen I just think it sounds really cool I don't want it to be I'll tell you what when I was in trouble as a boy it was Stephen so Steve would be even better <laughs> I'm gonna right from now on you're professor Steve for me there we go. right um honestly I when I when I first met you and that's a you know a few um zoom calls away and I feel like I know you already which is this modern world right with zooms yeah. Um, when we talk about brain science and experts, you've dedicated your life to the subject. Um, but the reason you dedicated you for life came about by some sadness and some personal, um, a, a really, a really interesting personal story. Would you like to, uh, so firstly, welcome. And would you like to share some of that story with us? Of course I would. And thank you. Um, so let's go back uh, to the Midwest. I was born in Columbus, Ohio. Dad was a professor of philosophy at the Ohio State University, the big Buckeyes American football team. My mom was a lecturer in English at Ohio State. My little sister and I uh, grew up a couple of miles from the OSU campus. We had great public schools back there. In some ways you could say, how could life have been any better? Sort of an idyllic life. Well, as I told you when you introduced yourself to me and I introduced myself to you a couple of months ago, there were some issues like the fact that dad for a month or three or six or at one point when I was in third grade, a full year at a time would just be gone. I'd wake up in the morning and well, where's dad? We're at breakfast and what about school? And and for the next 30 or 60 or 90 or 365 days, I had no idea where he was. What, what did your mom say? Like when my he was mom, just gone and you're having muesli for breakfast? Mom said as little as she could. And I'll tell you why in just a second. But I could tell by the look in her eye that I wasn't really allowed to ask, nor was my little sister. She said once, uh, your father is resting out in California Steve, it's best if you ask no more questions. So this was very unlike our usual family discourses, like we talked about ideas and we talked about sports. and we So something was really wrong, but nobody talked about it. And I could tell that look in my mom's eye. I could tell that something was dreadfully wrong, but if we talked about it, it might make it worse. So what did I do? 
I chose not to think that the world was just a horrible, random, cruel place. I chose to think that maybe something I had done or said drove dad away. But if I, and if I mentioned it now, maybe he'd never come back. What I did not know until I was 18 and came back from college on my first spring break back to Ohio was that dad's psychiatrist over at Ohio State had told him, you know, I knew nothing of this. I was three or four years of age when dad asked, what do I tell my children about my history? And his history involved very severe mental illness from the time he was 16 until now, several decades later, including a, a diagnosis of chronic schizophrenia, which turned out to be wrong, but no one knew it at the time. His doctor looked at him in the eye and said, Professor Hinshaw, if your children ever learn of your schizophrenia, your madness, and your hospitalizations, they'll be permanently destroyed. You and your wife are forbidden from ever mentioning the topic. Doctor's orders, silence, because mental illness was so toxic and pervasive, it would ruin our lives forever. So you just mentioned a moment ago, my book, Another Kind of Madness. There's a passage late in the book where I say, sort of cutting back from the memoir to a little narrative. What if an oncologist today saw a family and one of the parents had cancer and said, Ms. Smith, Mr. Waisaki, if your children ever learn of your cancer, you'll be permanently destroyed. You're forbidden from ever mentioning. Well, we sue the doctor for malpractice. I mean, families need support. The kids need to know that the parent's ill and be on the support team. And, and we talk about it. Back in the 50s and 60s, not so long ago in the US, it was so poisoned it could never be mentioned. So I lived in silence. I wondered what was wrong with myself and my family. Although when dad was back, he was perfectly normal. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was that was the question I was gonna ask you, yeah. Professor Steve. Like, um, the, the, the interesting thing for me is when your dad's name was Virgil, right? Yeah. When, when he was home, was he like just a cool dad? Was he what what we would, because I hate the word normal, right? Because, because I think that- part, I don't know what normal is either. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Because I'm not very normal, but that's cool. So was he what you would consider a normal dad? A normal day would be, uh, he would cook breakfast because mom had to get over to work early sometimes or mom would cook breakfast and he might drive my sister and me to elementary school or middle school a couple of miles away. And uh, we would certainly talk about the news in the paper. And we certainly talk about Ohio State football or basketball. And I would go into his study, a big home library from time to time and see his books on philosophy and on science and on literature. And I would ask him about philosophy. What's that when I was little? The study of the mind, son. The study of how human beings come to do right from wrong. The study of how people learn what they know, what science is, what ethics are. And I thought, wow, this is kind of, I got to learn a lot. I could learn more at home than I did at school. And dad seemed perfectly normal. Now, a few times he would seem kind of withdrawn and sad. And then maybe a couple of times something had gotten under his collar and he was, and then he'd be gone. So mm -hmm. what I was witnessing was the family's deft hiding of very severe bipolar disorder, what used to be called manic depressive illness. And he would be out and into some of the country's worst public hospitals for all those weeks, months, a year at a time with the doctor's orders never to let the family talk about it or the children know. So it was a wonderful yet very mysterious and strange childhood, to be quite honest. One of the, one of the things that fascinates me, why did you blame yourself? Well, I'm a developmental and clinical psychologist because of what I learned about my dad, as we'll talk about. But when you study developmental science and you figure out how kids come to perceive the world, what if something pretty bad is going on at home, like a dad's absences or abuse or parents are separating, all kinds of things. If no one talks about it, it remains kind of a mystery. So in some ways, there are two choices. I'm probably making it too simple, but A, the world is just a pretty awful place, not a very healthy way to think about the world as you're growing up, or B, I guess it's not just random. Maybe if I caused it, I've got some control over it. 
maybe I could bring dad back. Maybe I could bring mom and dad back together. So at the cost of internalizing, of feeling pretty bad about yourself, you maintain the illusion that you might be able to control it. And I think that's what I did, what a lot of kids do in situations like that. And so I think the other interesting thing is, and, and I've been writing because I think I spoke to you before that the reason I wouldn't reach out to get help was that my reference when I was growing up was one flow of the cuckoo's nest, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I thought that if I reached out, yep. um, then I was going to uh, be locked up with Jack Nicholson and the big American Indian guy called Chief, right? And what? that was a real fear. I can laugh about it now, but it was a real fear. The second yeah. thing I wrote down, and I forget yeah. the name of the movie, uh, Russell Crowe was in it. And it was oh, Beautiful about, Minds. Beautiful Minds. There we go. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, you are sort of explaining Beautiful Minds, right? But my, my question is this. Where does that stigma originally come from? Here is a father of two beautiful children, married, successful by all external rights. Right. And yet he is struggling with an illness that his psychiatrist, his doctor, I mean, he is a psychiatrist, right? So the doctor who told him to be silent was a psychiatrist. Yeah. So he's being told to live up to this stereotypical stigma. So what I want to know, why wouldn't I reach out for help? Why couldn't you be told as a child? And your story has ended up positive, right? And we'll yes, get back has. to your story, right? But it could have quite easily turned up negative. Fair? Yeah. yeah Too much absolutely. blame. Blame yourself, you know. So, so tell me, what? Where has the stigma for this illness come from? Where the hell did that come from? I hate that. I'm I'm glad you've invited me for a, a series of thirty seminar podcasts, so we can have a seminar on this for the rest of the semester. It's a huge issue. Uh, I wrote a book 13 years ago called The Mark of Shame, Stigma of Mental Illness and Agenda for Change, which turns out to be the first book written in English about not a book that's not just a compilation of chapters by other people. We know what stigma and prejudice are, but how do they apply to mental illness? So I went into history and anthropology and evolution and all kinds of things. We're human beings. We aren't, and especially when we were on the savannas of Africa, trying to come of age as a species, weren't that fast, weren't that strong. We had to bond together to survive, take care of our young for long periods of time. Now, if we didn't have very caring, close relationships with others, we'd have never made it. On the other hand, if we got too close to all of our fellow humans, maybe somebody would exploit us or maybe we get ill, of course, with the pandemic. That's a big fear right now, of course. Um, maybe those people act so differently from me and look so differently, they're a different tribe, they might annihilate us. So evolutionary theory says humans are very social, but there's a few triggers that might make us keep some people at bay, people who are contagious, people who look like they won't uh, reciprocate to you or people whose customs are just so different. So think of the sort of stereotype of mental illness, especially very severe ones where you're hearing voices or acting psychotic, or you're so depressed, you're not even sure life is worth living. Hey, look, Sir JK, I, it takes a lot for me every day to get up and go to work and do my stuff. Um, and then I hear somebody out on the street, doesn't have a home, doesn't smell very good, seems irrational, or I meet somebody who's so depressed that they, they not sure that, the, that they value their life anymore, that threatens my stability. I kind of want to keep them away to keep myself bolstered up and stable. So that's one of the theories of stigma that we tend to push away that that threatens our own sense of stability. And then we could go into a lot of topics here. Uh, the, the, back in the day, uh, the campfire stories about somebody acting very erratically, or today, uh, social media, or TV, radio, the predominant image of mental illness is you're aggressive and violent or you're not very competent or both. So media feeds this or evolutionary heritage feeds this. For a long time in earlier societies, much earlier, people who acted very apparently were cast out of their community and they lived in the woods like animals. And then institutions were set up and then the institutions became very big and they were like snake pits. Now we're in a model of community care, but we haven't invested enough in it so that 
throughout history and throughout just about every culture you can imagine, Western, Eastern, individual, collectivist, people who act very erratically compared to the norm really threaten too many people in society and are, are cast out. Now, do we have to be that way? No. Do we now know with psychological and psychiatric and brain science that no two brains are the same, that a lot of roots of creativity are geared in, if you will, behavior patterns that aren't exactly like yours and mine. If we learn to adapt our society so that it's okay to ask for help and that people with depressions like you and me, we go up and down. People with bipolar disorder go way up and then lay down. If we can come to a point where we understand that there truly is no normal, yet people who really have serious symptoms need treatment, we could turn the corners, we could become a more tolerant, a more humane, and a more productive set of societies. Instead, we're shooting ourselves in the foot all the time to push people away. So we're talking about pandemics, right? And one of the reasons that we created Mentimia was to put mental health on the agenda in the workplace, to put it on your personal agenda, to have a daily mental health plan. Yes. Um, getting back to the stigma, problem do you think the stigma so um and look you'll get used to me professor steve because you'll come up with real stats i have jk stats so don't take them don't take them too you know a, as givens but in new zealand there's some stats four percent of the population will be born with some sort of mental health issue right um bipolar schizophrenia uh, personality disorders blah 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 now 80 percent, 85 percent of our resource goes into them and that's fantastic i love that and they should always get that resource. The, the, the trouble that we're seeing is that what I would call me, traveling along Normandy, probably a little of anxiety in my background, didn't get any help for it, probably because of the stigma, and yep. I fall into a depression that could have cost me my life. So, um, you know, 800,000 people committed suicide last year worldwide. Do you believe that stigma is a big part of the problem between these two things i sort of i sort of talk about it like type one and type two diabetes right type one diabetes you're born with it and where you go type two can be a little bit more optional and i think type two depression is really the one that's killing a lot of our people do you think that stigma is a direct cause of people not getting out and getting the help absolutely so as you introduce me in my book, Another Kind of Madness, A Journey Through the Stigma and Hope of Mental Illness, why would I entitle a memoir about myself and our family, Another Kind of Madness? Well, isn't mm. madness a kind of old school derogatory term for mental illness? Well, this quote comes from uh, a book by James Baldwin called Giovanni's Room. And uh, it is brilliantly written like all of his books. And there's a sentence uh, in the first half of the book I couldn't even memorize the sentence. It's so long and beautiful. Uh, he says, madness is forgetting and remembering. One kind of madman is the person who remembers too much. Another kind of madness are people who forget their heritage. And my editor and I four years ago said, another kind of madness. And she looked me in the eye over Zoom, <laughs> even before the pandemic, because she was in New York and I was in Berkeley and said, isn't that what stigma is that you talk about? So bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, PTSD, major depression in childhood, autism spectrum, learning disorders, ADHD, serious anxiety. There's clearly a genetic liability for these conditions for some more than others. Early life experience, early adverse experience compounds that. And a certain percentage of people over time and adolescence is a big risk period, especially for girls, develop these forms of mental illness. Now, depression, as you know and I know, can be devastating. Bipolar disorder probably has the highest suicide rate of any disorder because you get the manias and depression simultaneous and you're agitated and impulsive. We now are still far from cures, but we've got effective treatments and effective coping. Stigma that says it's shameful you to, for you to have this illness. It must be your fault or you must be poison in your very genes, right? That, that stigma that says 
you don't deserve to have treatment, your family's tainted, that's another kind of madness. And as I say, it's worse than schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression or PTSD because it, A, makes society fearful of people like that, and B, when you internalize it, what we call self-stigma, you don't feel that you should be out in the world or getting treatment. So I believe that stigma is worse than any form of mental illness. And that's just not to say that mental illness is a picnic, right? It's yeah. saying that- I'm hearing you, I'm hearing you. If, I, if, I, we, if we give up hope, if, if we don't make treatments, I mean, in the United States, we fund the National Cancer Institute at far more uh, fiscal levels per capita than the National Institute of Mental Health, even though mental health is more prevalent than cancer. So. Stigma is, I think, the rate limiting factor for all that we have to do. I totally agree with you. So I just want to take you a little step back and and two things. So um, what I wrote a book called, I didn't write a book because I can't even spell versus Steve. So I got a, someone to ghost write it for me. But I wrote a couple of books. One was called All Blacks Don't Cry, which is my personal journey. The other one was called Stand By Me because I wanted to parent mental health in the home, right? Yeah. Yeah. So my parents didn't talk about this shit. Your father disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and they said to me, um, and I said, "What? how can I parent it? And the child psychiatrist, the psychologist said, um, sit down and have dinner every night, have a meal together. And I thought that's pretty easy. I'm, you know, I'm in an Italian household. And the second thing they said is show some vulnerability. That's right. And I went, wow, you know, and they said, well, you don't have to cry the first night, you dick. You know, you can just say, I'm upset about work, but that vulnerability, and once I started showing some vulnerability, it gave permission around the table for, right. for the rest of the family to have vulnerability. How do I parent the breakdown of stigma about mental health? Because I think sometimes we need generational change. The kids drive it, but if you go home and you don't have stigma, it's much easier to change. So how? what would your advice be to, to the parents that are listening to say, I need to break down the stigma. So if my child is suffering, yeah. or if I'm suffering, we can talk I'm about it. So I've got several answers, as you might guess, and I think they're all pretty important. Number one, our colleague back at Harvard Medical School, Professor William Beardsley, who lost his sister to suicide when he was in college, is very concerned about depression across generations. To be very brief, he's invented a form of therapy called family talk, and families talk about their issues used to be 16 sessions, four months, they made it shorter now. And at the beginning, it was made for families where one or both parents had bipolar or unipolar depression. And the idea was parent A, parent B, they need medicine if it's right for them, they need cognitive therapy if it's right for them. But in the family therapy, the goal is to get the parents in a few sessions when the kids are kicked out of the room and the therapist is coaching them to talk about not in psychi psychiatric or psychological terms, talk about uh, when daddy was away from home or mom's drinking or the, the stress around the home in words that kids can understand. And the parents often say, well, I don't want to talk about my depression or my, my mania. It's the most shameful thing on earth. And the therapist says, remember, that's what you signed up for. This is what we're going to do. So the therapist drags them over the goal line. The kids come back a couple weeks later and the family starts to talk about what everybody knows something's wrong and now it's more specific. Kids who get this kind of therapy, this family therapy, are not only better a few months later, four years later, with no further treatment, their risk of developing depression themselves is cut substantially. Genes matter for serious depression and for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, but communication matters too. Yeah. If you stop the internalization and stigma, people can thrive. So uh, that, that's one thing. Another thing that I've been doing for about 10 years now is working with high school kids, not in therapy groups, although I've done that in the past, but in clubs in secondary, middle, but mainly high schools in the United States that are called the stigma clubs, the anti-stigma clubs. So you might join a club, the Latin club or the rugby club, if it's not a varsity sport or the with a chess club or the stigma club. And the kids say, what's that? It's a club, meets once, maybe twice a week. There's a teacher, there's no mental health professional. 
And the kids, through a curriculum that we provide, not a very structured one, because we want the kids to devise their own ways of countering stigma, hearing guest speakers, being open, not just learning the facts about schizophrenia. That will teach you the facts about schizophrenia and actually make you a little more afraid because you learn the stereotypes. Kids who join these clubs, not only in some high schools in the United States, that's the largest club in the school with 175 students. Some, some of the clubs are small. If kids get the license to be social activists, do anti-stigma things and talk openly, they bring that to the dinner table at home. We think if we can start with the youngest generations and move back up, in a generation, we'll have a kind of cohort replacement and stigma will be very different. So what do we know from research in your country, United States and, and, and many other countries? People know a lot more factually about mental illness than 50, 60 years ago. So People I, are just as stigmatizing, if not more than 50, 60 years ago. It's not just about learning the facts, it's about being open. Yeah, also I think that you know social media channels you know, some people call them um, keyboard warriors, you know, so yep. Yep. They, they can find the courage to be more stigmatized or, or, or you know, throw more rocks. So I, th there's a there's a question that I want to ask you because, um, you know, you are a professor, you've studied stuff, especially in the child space. I have learned experiences and there's a couple of questions that I want to ask you because I get us this asked all the time by parents. Yeah. Um, you know, my daughter particularly is cutting herself. What do I do? What do you, you do? know? And unfortunately, in New Zealand at the moment, and it's no one's fault. It's just because this problem creeped up on us. They might wait seven months to get some help, but they need advice and help right now. Right. Um, and I just don't know what to say some of the times. But the parenting of that moment is very, very important, isn't it? It really is. And there comes a time in your culture and our culture and in many cultures where you're just about in pre-teen years, early teen years, the last thing you want to do is be seen with your parents. I mean, what's adolescence time of? It's independence. Uh, go procreate. I mean, being in school forever is kind of recent in our species. And so kids keep their parents at bay. It's hard for parents to ask what we call middle school, junior high school. At the same time, kids, even though they won't tell you this, are desperately longing for parents to stay connected with them, to keep them engaged in the dinnertime conversations, to ask about what's troubling them. Now, pre-adolescence is a stormy time, but it's also the time when girls start to cut in record numbers in, in far too many countries and where anxiety really blossoms. And Parents don't need to be a trained therapist. Parents need to keep, even though your kid seems as though they're resisting like mad, keep lines of communication open. We're doing a better job with school mental health in, in, in schools in the United States. Once the kid can begin to open up even a little, sees a window of hope, then it could be peer support. It could be counseling at school. It could be more serious psychological and psychiatric care. But if everybody's walking on eggshells around it, then it festers. And we know what happens when things fester. It doesn't get better. Why do they cut? I, I heard that it actually, re, it actually has some relief for so anxiety it, or pain. This is one of the areas I'm doing a lot of work with my lab with. There's a lot of experts, your country and ours, about what's sometimes called NSSI, non-suicidal self-injury. Your goal isn't to end your life, but your goal is to get this inner pain. Maybe if you see the blood or feel it, it's a different way of expressing it. Or as you suggest, and there's some good research behind this, it's a kind of temporary relief from the stress at home or your bad feelings about yourself or conflicts with your peers or at school. The physical release of pain, it kind of like takes your mind off temporarily the deeper issues. Of course, it's very short-lived that deeper pain comes back and you get into a self-fulfilling prophecy and a vicious cycle. So, there, and of course, part of the reason it's getting so prevalent is kids know what other kids are doing. So some of it is a bit of social imitation, but we think it's a, it's a maladjusted way of trying to regulate your emotions. There's much healthier ways to do it. And something called DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, 
is really one of the evidence-based treatments that can really help kids with that. Uh, what so I've, I've spoken to parents who have a perception, and I don't really know their you know I don't go inside their houses, but they they are caught by surprise because everything seems to be going well. So there's nothing. Let's presume there's nothing going on in the home. Right. So why is it so prevalent now? What is what is the cause? Is it is it the you know the expectation? I believe our youngsters have more expectation on them than we ever had. Um, so what do you think? So let's just say life's normal at home. There's nothing going on there. Why right. would a surprisingly normal person want to cut? So I have some ideas about this. And in one of the 12 books that you noted quickly in the introduction uh, from about a decade ago is called The Triple Bind, Saving Our Teenage Girls from Today's Pressures. Now, boys have it tough too, but girls, especially in that second decade of life from 10 or 11 to 19 or 20, skyrocket ahead of boys in terms of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, cutting behaviors, so the quick summary of the hypothesis in this book is, if you're a girl, most cultures around the world, you're still the caregiver and nurturer. That's sort of, you know, the stereotype, but still true. Number two, in most Western societies now, you're doing better than these ill-witted uh, Ill boys academically, and, and you can get athletic scholarships. So a lot of pressure to be very successful and nurturing. But the third aspect, the third part of the triple bind is, if you're a guy, it doesn't matter how you look, you can be kind of quirky and if you make it fine. Girls have to do this looking very sexualized and hot and effortlessly. So how do you be the number one nurturer and the number one competitor and the sexiest looking effortless? You can't do that physically or psychologically. And I think the pressures are intolerable these days. And I think we as a society and as parents and schools, if there's a million suggestions. Does every course need to be graded? Can homework be uh, uh, dolloped out in smaller doses? Can kids be on committees to help run how a school assembly is done? Uh, so we hear from them legitimately rather than their figureheads. And simple things like a family having dinner together and the kid not feeling judged by their productivity, but who, who they are as a person. These are the protective factors against cutting and some of the other real trials and tribulations of adolescence these days. I was out for dinner last night with a group of very um, successful CEOs. And, and this is a question to you for all of us parents out there. And I just want to explain a situation in New Zealand, which was the question, but it happens all around the world. So um, it seems that as parents and as adults, we go through life thinking the kids are going to be okay, right? Yeah. So the, the, the problems affect us, but we think the kids are okay. So the question that I got asked, which I could not answer, was we had a, an earthquake in Christchurch. Very, yeah. very, very bad earthquake. Um, and then we also had a very, very bad mosque shooting, right? Yeah. We had one of the worst in the history of our country in one of the saddest days uh, I've ever experienced. This particular father said, my kids have grown up during that and there was a, a personal thing that happened, their house burnt down, right? Mm. But when you think about the world right now and all these issues, you know, I'm sure there's there's um, some stuff going on in, in, uh, in America, add COVID to it. His yeah. question was, what do I do? How do I talk in the home? They, they're not showing any signs, but what should I be doing as a parent to make sure that they don't um, suffer any sort of post-traumatic or... Yeah. So he was at a loss. And obviously, you know, I left school at 15. I can't answer it. And I said, I don't really know, but I'm talking to a pretty cool guy tomorrow. So I'll ask him. <laughs> so what you're getting at here, and let me add to the list of maladies, and we're growing up in a world that unless we do something about it soon, uh, climate is gonna change drastically. And what's the future of life on earth for, for us humans in particular? So there's a lot of dread, there's a lot of despair, there's a lot of what's the world isn't gonna be like it was and how do we deal with this? So I don't have the answers to those questions. I know we need to do a lot of work on some of these fundamental human issues of racism and climate change, et cetera. But I also know from my work and from other people who study this, 
that there's something called resilience. And there's something called when things get rough in a family, uh, in a society, in a world, it's especially young people as their brains are still plastic and they're developing and want to reach out and do great things, but feel stymied at the same time. Talking as a family about fears doesn't mean you're showing the pictures over and over again, uh, again of 9-11, the World Trade Center blowing up. Doesn't mean you show the earthquake pictures over and over again. I think media perpetuates some trauma in that way. But if you can talk to kids about the reality of what they're feeling, not talking down to them, not pretending that everything is fine, in some ways it frees up kids to get together with their peers to figure out how we're going to do it differently. We're going to do better than this generation of our parents and, and our teachers. And it sounds kind of magical. Resilience, which would be the overcoming of adversity, either in a family or yourself or in a society, is fed by communication and support. It's fed by, especially growing up when you're very little, a warm uh, attachment-filled home. It's also fed by societies who don't think that there's just one right way to do everything. It's just like stigma. There's many kinds of behavior in the world. There's many kinds of solutions to these seemingly intractable problems we had. Let's listen to kids and they're gonna help us figure this out. I think resilience is a real possibility. I think that's a really, really interesting topic because um, I, will, I, I struggled as a parent because I felt that I always had to have the answer, yeah, right? right? And um, I got some advice and they said, and I believe that my, me and my dad were a generation apart, right? So he yeah. knew when he was out, I was going to steal his whiskey, try and drive his car, smoke behind the shed, right? So he sort of knew all the shit I was going to get up with up to so he sort of caught me all the time yeah. but i don't know the world that my kid lives in with social media and the pressure that he's under and so yeah. this person said to me just ask you don't have to know the answers and it, and it feels like you know if we're talking about a, a a traumatic moment like an earthquake or a mosque shooting um parents are scared to ask because they want they think as parents they should have the answer so what do you do do you say you know do you say something like Look, I'm really worried that that's affected you. Let's talk about it. I don't. I don't know. How would you approach yeah, that? Just, there's no right opening. Just get an opening. Yeah. I don't know how to talk about it. It freaks me out sometimes too. Here's what I you know. Whether it's meditation, whether it's prayer, whether it's exercise, how do you get yourself into a space where you can kind of be yourself and eventually be productive? Or what does it feel like when you go down that rabbit hole and it's hard to get out of? If parents and kids, teachers, parents with the kids that they parent or, or teach can be open about vulnerability, nobody's kidding anybody anymore. And I think things can emerge that we don't know what the answers would be before we started that process. And, and if I might, you mentioned you with your dad. So I just want to go back to make a couple of more points about me and my dad, if I might, before Love we uh, Love you time too. all together. So as I... My first spring break from college, 18, dad pulls me in a study and starts to tell me about this life of schizophrenia and hospitalizations. And I knew something must have been terrible but to justify all that silence. Uh, so I decided to go into psychology and here I am years later, but I also was terrified because I didn't talk to anyone else. I was afraid that I couldn't be a psychology major with a dad with schizophrenia or then later as I diagnosed bipolar disorder, I didn't want roommates or girlfriends to know, I, I'd be ashamed. So it took me a while to open up. But what I learned was that dad's issue started when he was a teenager, 16, living in Southern California, major prohibitionist father, his mother who died when he was young, his uh, stepmother were both missionaries. So a pretty stern household. And because again, a loss of a parent at three is a risk factor for mood disorders. Having an abusive parent, his stepmother was abusive to him. So he had kind of the genes uh, and the early loss and the, the abuse. Things seemed to be kind of normal until he was 16. And he got this idea as he couldn't sleep for about a week and wandered the streets of Pasadena, California all night, that he had been put on earth to save the free world from Hitler and Mussolini and the fascists. Because the visitors to 
his father's home. These prohibition leaders from around the world would talk about the oncoming threat of fascism. And now we can look back and say, doesn't sleep, gets the idea he's the savior. Um, he's developing a fast episode of mania, which was true. And his third night of being out all night, he went back to his house, climbed to the roof and jumped, thinking his arms had become wings and that he could fly. And this would send a message to the world's leaders to stop Hitler and Mussolini. So he'd gone from zero to 180 quickly with a psychotic episode of mania. He was put in a back ward with adults. He thought the food was poisoned for the next six months. He was an athlete, not as good as you, but you know, he played football and he was a shot putter. And he went from 185 to 117 pounds. They gave, gave him up for dead. And then suddenly, a few months after that, six months later, for a few days, he was fine. They just just discharged him. And the family never talked about it because they didn't want Jinx's recovery. His five brothers, his father, and his stepmother. He goes off to grad school in, in philosophy, went to Stanford for college, Princeton, great grad school. In fact, he knew John Nash of a beautiful mind, the real John Nash, when he was a grad student at Princeton. No way, that's so awesome. incredible. Just as World War II is ending, he thinks he can tell the end of it by telepathy. His mind is going again. They ship him off to Philadelphia State Hospital unbeknownst to him, the worst mental hospital in the United States, 7,000 men in space for 1,400. Conscientious objectors smuggled out photographs from the year he was there of shallow graves and starvation and beatings. Dad was beaten every week when he was there. His brother came to take him on a day pass one day, driving up from Washington, D.C., before freeways. They got out the first time Dad had been in the hospital in three months. and. Um, he started translating the road signs into German and saying that he was being held in a concentration camp in Germany and his brother had to get them back because he was a collaborator. So boy, I thought, you know, I heard this story years later that if you get that depressed and manic, you can have a lot of psychotic thoughts at some point. But I didn't realize until years after that what the Byberry State Hospital was like. One of the people who visited it at that point also that same year was at the liberation of the concentration camps in Germany and Poland and said that Byberry was the closest thing he'd ever seen in America to a concentration camp. So at a different level, dad knew that this was the plight. This talk about stigma. At age 16 and 24, you're on a backward and basically given up for dead. So, you know, I diagnose him after I, you know, out of college, dad and I talk closely. He gets on the right treatment, lithium, et cetera, et cetera. I send him articles about bipolar disorder. Two years before he died, we had a beautiful talk one spring evening outside by a pool. And he said, uh, son, and he was starting to fail a little bit. He had some Parkinson-like symptoms. I think he got on the wrong medications and had too many shock therapies unnecessarily earlier. But he said, son, um, do you know what the term mental illness means to a philosopher like me? I said, no, well, tell me what you mean. He said, well, um, mental illness, I guess my illness has been imaginary. I just made up the symptoms. Do you know how many times I wished I'd had cancer in my life? Wow. I, said, well, I said, dad, what, what do you mean cancer? I thought, is he having an episode? He said, son, if I'd had a real illness like cancer, I could have maybe forgiven myself. Mm. But all I had was a mental illness. And you know, here I am, I'm in my early 40s, I'm a professor. I thought I knew something. But dad taught me you know, his last two years of life that if you've been shunned and put down and there's no evidence-based treatment for you, why wouldn't you blame yourself? Why wouldn't you take on all that stigma? And so during his adult years, after his disclosure to me, half of him knew that he had this thing called bipolar disorder and lithium helped him. And the other half of him kind of realized that he was at fault for all of his episodes. He was really to blame. So that taught me a lot about how long stigma can go on in a family and in a person. It's really, it's really interesting because, and I want to talk about the science of, of the brain, which really helped me to accept my mental illness. But yeah. Yeah. I, I say to people, it's an illness, not a weakness, but the symptoms make you feel weak. Yeah. So the three things that happened to me is I lost my self-esteem. Yep. 
I lost my self-confidence and I lost my enjoyment in life. And life's pretty shit without those three things. That's right. But the interesting thing was, um, and I think the, the sustained uh, anxiety we have in our lives, the, the sustained, um, you know, life that we live, like people, people wear stress and anxiety as a badge, which I believe is really, really dangerous, but it's driving our brains. Um, but the science of the brain was now obviously your your father was uh in, you know in the in the four percent or three percent whatever the exact figures are yeah but what what amazed me was when i went to a psychiatrist for the first time they started explaining the science yep now i didn't know anything we, we didn't get taught about the science and and like she explained it to me and i read this book called zebras don't get ulcers right by now, robert sapolsky our stanford colleague right yeah, there you go. And um, it was really hard going for me, who's a little bit on the dyslexic scale and, and quite technical. And I've just recently downloaded it as an audio book, but I got this out of it and I tell it to everyone. A zebra's on the savannah, he's having a feed, the lion comes out of the bush, he chases him because he wants him for breakfast, the zebra gets away, what does he do? Goes back to eating grass. What do we do? What do we do? Spend the rest of our lives worrying about the lion in the bush, right? That's right. So tell me, once you start, I mean, incredible life story. Your dad's story is incredible. It is like a beautiful mind story. And you start studying this, right? Yeah. Tell me about the science. Why is it so important we understand the science to, because it helped me get better? So this would take a lot longer than we have time for, but I'll try to distill it down. The science, the epidemiology, the public health, just doing surveys around the world, mental illness isn't rare. This isn't one in 100, it's not even one in 20. By adulthood, if you include very severe mental illnesses where you're abusing drugs and you're hearing voices, that's about one in 20. But if you include moderate depression, anxiety, adult ADHD, this is one in three adults is gonna experience a significant mental illness in their lifetime. Some people will say one in two, I think that's pushing it a little bit. But this isn't uh, people, uh, it, it, as I say in another kind of madness, it's not them, it's us. It's in everybody's family. It's in most people you talk with, right? Some to have more degrees than others. Number two, we are born with our full set of DNA. The DNA has been shaped throughout evolution. We know that certain DNA combinations in some people make them more vulnerable to bipolar disorder, serious depression, schizophrenia, ADHD, autism, et cetera. But this doesn't mean that they're born with deviant genes. Why would those genes still be persistent throughout our 200,000 years as homo sapiens sapiens, unless relatives or milder degrees of those genes weren't adapted. So ADHD, which I study a lot, it's not very um, healthy in a modern classroom or in a one room schoolhouse 100 years ago to be running around and being impulsive. But back in the day in Asia, and this fascinating genetic anthropology of this, People who, when the Bering Strait wasn't a strait, but it was a landmass, the people who migrated over to modern day Alaska, Canada, the United States, South America, have a form of the gene that is, makes you liable to ADHD. They were the explorers, right? So what prompted you to be active and reaching out to new lands in that circumstance doesn't turn out to be so good in a classroom. It's not about bad genes. It's not about necessarily bad environments, it's about the fit. We know that, and of course, if we had DNA typing you know, some years ago, we could have DNA typed my dad. Um, he clearly had a genetic vulnerability and given some of the illnesses in many of his relatives, that's undoubted. But losing his mother at three and being the only one of the six boys abused by the stepmother between seven and 11, it was kind of a triple combo. It's not just genes and brains, it's not just difficult life experiences. For the most severe cases of mental illness, when you put those together, that's when you start to really need to reach out and get help. 
our treatments are so much. I mean, dad back in the thirties in that first hospitalization, when he was 16, there was no medications and no therapy. In the forties, when he was at Byberry State Hospital, he got um, insulin coma therapy, the forerunner of the shock treatments and one flew over the cuckoo's nest and some sedatives. He got the wrong meds and more shock treatments for the next 30 years. Finally, he got on lithium and he was symptom free for a number of years. If we can figure out which genes and which environments put people at most risk, and if we can figure out how to make the world a more healthy and less stressful place for everybody, then we're going to be on the way, not only to helping many people with mental disorders, but starting to erase the stigma. I mean, the pandemic is a world shattering event. We haven't seen anything like it in 100 years. United States has been uh, not like your country in terms of being adherent to masking and doing all the things you've done. But one of the silver linings just may be with the increased anxiety and depression and stress related to the pandemic, maybe we'll all realize that we're in it together. And it's not a sign of weakness to admit that you're feeling anxious or down or squirrely or you, you need to get out and much less unemployment. It's a sign of strength to get help for your problems. We exercise our muscles with exercise. We know that exercise is the best, uh, uh, best brain treatment we can give to prevent all sorts of illnesses and getting psychological help or medication if you need it. Again, would I be ashamed of getting uh, an injection or my uh, medications for asthma or diabetes? No. Remember my dad, what if he'd had cancer? That was a question to me. In the United States in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, if you died of cancer, that never went in your obituary because everybody knew that cancer was a, a psychosomatic illness that you basically had brought upon yourself because you'd lost a will to live. Cancer. The science has advanced in the last 50 years. We, we don't, I mean, there is lung cancer and breast cancer and prostate cancer, but we diagnose cancers on the basis of the cells and how they proliferate. Cancer is now a cause. The science has advanced and people with cancer have banded together to get rights for treatment and access and public support. So I think the first time we talked, I said in the United States, you know, pro football, American football, the big behemoths wear pink knee socks once every fall or twice in the stadiums. Of course, the stadiums are empty this year, but mo mostly they're full filled with, with fans. Pink knee socks in support of breast cancer research. And what color do the pro football dudes wear in um, support of mental health research? Sorry, we don't have that color yet. Yeah, yeah. It's not arrived, but I think we're on the cusp. It's coming. We're coming. It's coming. And I think young people are gonna carry the day. So tell me, um... You know, you spoke about the bipolar, schizophrenia, ADHD. So tell me why there's such a rise in, what, in the people that don't have a predisposition, you know, disposition for this. You know, that's what scares me the most. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, a mod I, I talk about, you know, people ask me about bipolar and schizophrenia. I say the great thing is a lot of research going in yeah. and, you know, hopefully the drugs will get better and treatment will get better and better. But the scary thing is actually what I call the mise of this world, you know, the, yep, yep. the, yeah. So, you know, the science behind that, what do people need to do to make sure they look after their mental health on a daily basis? We talk about, we yep. talk about the six pillars and I, I call it my daily mental health brain, you know, chill, connect, do, move, celebrate and enjoy. I often use a term for persistent Steve, which is, you know, we get more inputs in our brain in a day today than our grandparents got in a lifetime. So if your computer craps out, what do you do? You know, you unplug it and plug it back in and it normally works, right? So our brains are no different. So what's the science going on in the modern world with 150 emails rushing here and rushing there? What is causing this? So let's talk about Sapolsky's book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. He's an expert in stress. So back when we were on the savannah with the zebras and the lions and the hyenas, right? If a lion came after a human, if you don't have a fear response and flee, you're dead. So all the cortisol levels and all the metabolic changes and the blood rushing out to your muscles and periphery to get you out of there, if we didn't have that stress response, we wouldn't survive. 
Well, we don't live on the savannas very much anymore. We live in cars and we go to school forever. And the industrial, post-industrial world is a source of stress. And the news we read every day stresses us out. There's a concept, a fancy concept called allostatic load. Allostatic load. Allostatic load. So if you and I get stress, you know, if you feel the earthquake coming over there, I do here in the Bay Area, um, you know, we got a duck and cover. We got that's a natural response. But what if we felt stress every moment of every day? Remember, a fear response is when the lion comes or the earthquake's going on. It's anxiety when that stimulus is more nebulous. I'm a bit afraid of going to school every day. I'm afraid of going to work every day. I'm afraid of climate change. When fear becomes not directed at a single source, but it's kind of ubiquitous, but our body's responding like it's a fear response all the time, our circuits burn out. Our brain circuits burn out. Our hormones are overproduced and overproduced. An allostatic load means it's the kind of crash, the system crash of too much daily stress with no way of relieving it. And I think that's why we're seeing rising rates of most forms of mental illness these days, not just the severe ones, but everyday anxiety. In that book, The Triple Bind I mentioned, focusing on teenage girls for a moment, did a little metaphor in the book. So what if we put, I wouldn't call this an ethical experiment, we put a bunch of teenagers, boys and girls, uh, in, a, in a certain classroom, and we sealed off the doors and for the next week, piped in cigarette smoke, tobacco smoke. Well, the skin would get red and everybody would be coughing and it would be terrible for health. That raises everybody's level of system distress because of all the 200 tars and poisons in, in cigarette smoke. Those who had genetic vulnerability to lung cancer would develop it earlier. So toxic stress does us all in to some degree but those with underlying vulnerabilities, early trauma or genetic risk might have the most explicit responses, but everybody's suffering. I think our brains are short circuiting in this uh, mainly urban, overstressed, not much to do about it world. And uh, it's not gonna take just psychologists and psychiatrists, but it's gonna take mentimia and it's gonna take uh, the bring change to mind high school clubs I've been mentioning and a lot more to give people coping resources on a daily basis. And this is one of the things that we that that I would talk about because, um, like I said, went out for dinner with these CEOs, and man, they are on the limit all the time. Yeah. What is what is a couple of things you would suggest to the CEOs of this world to do on a daily basis? A for themselves and B for the business. So, I'll go. Uh, AA and then A and B. AA, make sure that with your good CEO salary, you're giving back and supporting good causes, right? I think that's real important. B for themselves, the six pillars you just mentioned. If you're a CEO of a high-powered company, you have to be ahead of, ahead of the curve. You gotta be activated all the time. We read about Elon Musk and what he does and you know, visionaries and you're gonna burn your, your body and your brain out if you don't watch it. And for your employees, it's great to have an HR that looks after people if they're feeling distressed. And America, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act that can give accommodations for people with a mental or physical disability in the workplace. But I would say, even though this is out of my expertise, reshape the workplace as best you can. When people feel empowered, when people feel um, the agency that what they do means something in their corporate setting, in their, in their workplace, not just being a cog in the wheel. And when people have opportunities to improve their health through exercise, through meditation, and being sort of physically and mentally active, everybody wins. I think the bottom line of the company would go up and the employees will stick around a long time. Uh, uh, we, uh, I interviewed uh, Susie McAlpine, who wrote a book called Burnout, and I told her this that I was gonna steal her saying. She said, it's no use fixing the fish if the water's toxic. That's so I right. guess the message to the CEOs is make sure the big fish is looking after himself. But I know we're a bit limited for time, Professor Steve. So I just wanted to talk about the six pillars. I wanted yeah. to ask you what you do. So what do you do to chill out? Well, 
for one year and five days. Not that I'm counting. Uh, I have not been able to play full court basketball three times a week with my buddies and students and friends much younger than I, which I live for. Um, but after up and down for the last months, my local gym, not with full court basketball, is open. And if I work out a few times a week or I get on the exercise bike or get out to the track and jog, my knee can't do the fast running I used to do as much. It helps my brain and it helps my morale. Ask my wife, ask our youngest son who's 17. <laughs> They'll, don't believe me, believe them. Be, how, do you, how do you connect? How do I connect? I'm uh, a bit of a Zoom addict, both for meetings and catching up with friends far away. Um, it's not the same as being in person, but I think I think the world is going to approach herd, uh, uh, herd immunity soon, and we'll be in a different mentality and, and, and ability to to um, to connect with people live. And I really do, as a clinical and developmental psychologist, working with kids and families, studying brains and genes, and schools and family interactions, trying to combat the stigma. I I feel a sense of purpose every day. So connection with family, exercise, hiking. I would rather exercise than meditate. I probably should get back to that a bit more. But a sense of purpose will do wonders for you. I'll tell you that. What, what do you do? So when we talk about do with the six pillars, for example, during COVID, I took up the guitar. I yeah. sound like I'm killing a cat in the lounge, but it's something that I do just for me. Right. And what are you doing at the moment just for you? Just for me, I'm tackling the New York Times crosswords with a pen every morning. And if you've <laughs> ever done them, Monday's pretty easy by Thursday, Friday. But I'm getting better. I'm getting better. And I think just, you know, my mom was an English teacher. Dad was a philosopher. When dad was in grad school at Princeton, he studied with Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein. There's a big legacy in my family. Book. I want to stay sharp a long time. So well, I, started, I started a crossword crossword puzzle in 89 i still haven't finished it anyway um, <laughs> how do you celebrate celebrate well i'm looking forward to the day when i can do celebrations with my lab of 20 students and uh, lab assistants and whatever soon in person i celebrate by spending more time with family our two older boys are in their 30s evan is the baby at 17 and a half i celebrate by just taking a pause in a day and getting a little extra exercise in or taking a walk and trying, because you know it's an endless cycle in Zoom meetings and on your computer. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's busier than ever in some level. And if you don't decompress a bit, you feel like a rabbit or a whatever the right animal is, a yeah. hamster on a wheel. So I try to do that. I'm, I'm not good at it, but I'm trying more. What do you enjoy? What do I enjoy? I enjoy good food. I enjoy family. I enjoy sports. I enjoy being outdoors. And I enjoy feeling as though maybe, you know, everything's relative, right? Compared to when my dad was young, mental health has made big leaps. We still barely know what's happening in these 100 trillion synapses in our brain all the time. If I feel, I enjoy the feeling of maybe making a couple of steps and that students of mine or other people who read my work or people I can inspire or my students inspire, maybe the trajectory can be upward. I enjoy that. Which public figures around the world do you think have great habits and behaviors around well-being and mental health? Boy, I probably am not the best person on that. Of course, we've been uh, in in an era the last few years where there has been political shifts and some of the public political figures have not been uh, as admirable as we would like, is my in my opinion. I think your PM is a role model and I've seen your podcast with her. Uh, I think I, I long for the days and I almost had a shot at it because a friend of mine did this when Barack Obama was president and had the outdoor basketball hoop set up at the White House. And I would have given anything to play because I could outshoot Brock any day. Let me say <laughs> bring it on. Bring it on. What are you um, reading? I'm reading. I love to read short stories and novels to kind of get out of the science. I'm reading 
David Mitchell's The Bone Clocks. Mm. My 17-year-old and I are reading and rereading the collected short stories of T.C. Boyle, mm. Thomas Corrigison Boyle, a Santa Barbara writer here. I reread recently Beloved by Toni Morrison. Um, I just want more time to read, but it's fun. Yeah. yeah. What Are you listening to podcasts? Do you do podcasts or not? I, I give more than I listen to them because if if I listen to them too much, I can't get my work done because I'm half time at UC Berkeley and half time at UCSF. And the pandemic has been a heavy lift for everybody to keep morale up and keep services going and keep research going. So uh, it, I, I won't lie to you and say, here's the five podcasts I've listened to recently because I haven't. Beautiful. What for you is an open mind? Boy, let me pause on this one. An open mind is somehow, I mean, we're all creatures of habit. We all tend to do the stuff well that we do well and avoid the stuff we don't do well. We started that in grade school and we keep on doing it. An open mind in part is finding ways to challenge yourself, not just to think and do the same things. It's really hard to change habits. And a different kind of open mind is, I think, you get an immediate revulsion to somebody you listen to on the radio or somebody you see on the street. Not, you know, Of course, you see them on the street in America with masks now most of the time. Can you challenge yourself to reframe? Maybe you don't know the shoes they walked in. You don't know the trouble they've had. Maybe a slightly different understanding, and this could cut across not only the people you've been on the street, but racial and religious and mental health groups, trying to get a little empathy behind the different places people have been. I think that's an open mind. This has been incredible. You know, when you when you start looking at podcasts, people say, oh, you know, make sure you make them short and make sure that this time, that time, this time. I just looked at my clock and there's been an hour and 10 minutes gone apart. <laughs> look at that. Then, I'm just looking at mine too. <laughs> that for me was fascinating. Um, thank you so much for your time. We're going to do a part two, but that for me was informative. Um, I asked some questions that have been on my mind and um, just thanks, Professor Steve, it was awesome. But that's the end of part one. You're not getting away that easy. We'll come back to you. I know you've got a, an appointment tonight. I'll be back at you shortly. So thanks very much. That was awesome. Thank you. And thank you for being the role model you are of vulnerability and reaching out and getting help and not being ashamed of it for everybody out your way and around the world. And it's disclosure is contagious. You yeah. got to get used to not that everybody discloses all the time to everyone but when you do it well it gives other people the courage to do it another just before we finish i met a guy with bipolar the other day um i was doing a function and he was amazing and he said to me you know jk um we need to stop talking about the negatives of an illness yeah he said when i was diagnosed he was diagnosed late at 23 he said uh, it was really scary all we spoke about was the you know, was the negatives, but he said, this illness has some amazing parts to it. So let's right. start talking about that. So, you know, I yeah. think we'll, we'll investigate that the next time. I think one of the things for, for both you and I, and the reason why we've created Mentimer is we want to help, you know, 100 million people and save 100,000 lives, but we want to do it by preventative. We want the knowledge that we've got in brain, beautiful brains like yours, and what we've learned from your past and your dad's past and my past to get people to act to be proactive. You know, you talked about the smoking before. In the 70s and 80s, everyone smoked because they didn't know that it was bad for you, right? right. It's mental health turn. It's our Thank turn you. to get people to do preventative stuff. So it's been a pleasure. Enjoy your evening. And Thank I'll you. see you next time. Until next time. Thanks a lot. Until next time. Bye.